Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to announce the second lecture by Brian Conrad. On, uh, it's an introduction to Guat Kitze theory. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so I'd like to begin by uh, making uh, two corrections to some uh, calculations, I, uh, some things I said uh, last time. Um, the first one relates to, uh, so inside of uh, PGL2 of K, um, <clears throat> so I mentioned there were two different classes, uh, conjugacy classes of maximal compact subgroups, uh, one of which was this more kind of unusual one, not related to a, a sort of uh, integral model with, with uh, PGL2 uh, <clears throat> integral structure. And uh, let me first re recall what this, what this actually is. I may not have written it explicitly last time. Um, so it consists of the matrices in PGL2 whose entries are uh, in the valuation ring for OO and then the maximum ideal on the lower left. Um, together with this one extra element, uh, make sure I get this right here, uh, zero, one over pi, one, zero. And you can check that this thing normalizes that. Um, and if you square this, then you get a scalar matrix. Now, <clears throat> the, the thing I said, I think it was incorrect last time was, um, so informally speaking, you might imagine that if there were an integral model that was gonna recover this thing, then this guy uh, of order two would sort of maybe account for some disconnectedness. And this should roughly speaking account for the integral points of the uh, identity component, so to speak. Um, and that if you reduce it, mod the maximal ideal, then you would not even think, oh, that should go to zero and I should get some upper triangular group like that. All right, that's completely wrong um, for two reasons. First of all, uh, inside of PGL2, that's actually two dimensional, right? Because the, uh, there's a scaling action that we're ignoring. Uh, but a smooth model of a three dimensional generic fiber would have to have three dimensional special fiber. So the statement that the reduction of this is the Borel of PGL2 is completely false. Um, so that's one reason it has to be wrong. Uh, and the other reason is if you actually try to do the calculation, you just, of course, find that it's wrong. Um, so let me tell you what this actually does have as the special fibers. This is, uh, I'll call this G1 of O. And I'll, I'll just tell you what the special fiber uh, comes out to be. Uh, so it is three-dimensional. Uh, a GM acting on a GA cross GA in a way that I'll describe, and there's an extra Z mod two. And this action is given by, so I call this thing T, and I call this XY in this group, uh, T, X, Y, T inverse, winds up being um, uh, T, X, T inverse Y. And uh, this element of order two, which comes from this guy, if you unravel what's going on, the effect of this on here is to take the GM and invert it and to take XY and send it to YX. Anyway, that's not, not neither here nor there. I just wanted to sort of point out, one can write down what these uh, integral models are and calculate and the special fiber winds up being maybe this slightly unexpected thing, but it's, it's not the Borel of PGL2, the dimension would be wrong. All right, that's one correction from last time. Um, <coughs> And the other one uh, relates to a, a picture that I drew, um, and we'll be coming back to this. So we also had this uh, unusual uh, K tilde inside SP4 of O. So this was some maximal compact that was not obtained by some kind of conjugation operation. It had this slightly uh, strange form. So let me just remind you uh, what it is, because we're going to be coming back to this a little bit later. So in terms of four by four matrices, these had entries like this, O, 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 M inverse, O, M, O, O, M, 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 O. All right, so matrices of this type. <clears throat> so this was this uh, unusual maximal compact subgroup and um, so I said two things about this that were incorrect. Uh, one uh, had to do with, I, I made some claim about what it's gonna wind up uh, being the stabilizer of in the building. Uh, and of course, 
I'll, I'll make the correction now. Of course, that statement is not something that could be readily recognized as incorrect since I haven't even given the appropriate definitions of the building yet. Um, but let me just say that when you write down the, uh, the root system for, uh, for SP4, so these guys like this, and then we put in the negatives. Oops. Negative A plus B, negative B, negative A. Uh, so when we put these all in, and when we draw, when we draw in um, the uh, the various additional affine lines. Ooh, let me use my colored chalk. Um, so when we drew in these these additional lines corresponding to adding an integer uh, to the roots, uh, I said that. This guy winds up being the stabilizer of this. That was incorrect. Um, this, this triangle here uh, is actually the fundamental chamber that winds up being the correct one to look at. Uh, so if I call this point here x tilde, uh, this winds up being, so if this is our group G, uh, this, this winds up being, we'll, we'll, we'll see later where this is coming from. Um, <clears throat> but this winds up being the stabilizer of that point rather than I think yesterday I was talking about this triangle here and looking at that point. So <clears throat> anyway, that's one, one small correction. Um, and uh, another is I made a claim about the, uh, the special fiber of this thing. So I said this has come from some particular uh, smooth integral model and it made a statement about what the special fiber is. Uh, I said that it was uh, SL2. Uh, it's actually two copies of SL2. And uh, we'll see uh, a little bit later where these two copies are coming from, okay? Oh, I'm sorry, 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 the, uh, the reductive quotient. So if we take the special fiber, mod out by the unipotent radical, we get two copies of SL2 over the residue field, okay? So anyway, so those are uh, <clears throat> two corrections. Um, from yesterday, so these calculations for these uh, explicit groups. Um, in fact, why don't I just tell you right now where these SL2s are coming from? So if we think in terms of four by four matrices, uh, two ways you can see some SL2s is take these entries like that, or take uh, And at zeros in the places where I haven't written things, so like zero, zero, and so on, <laughs> or zero, 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 so on. Um, so the entries, the two by two and these asterisk locations, those are some SL2s. Hmm? Yes. No, what I'm saying is that if you take the integral model of this and you take the reductive quotient. Oh, yeah, yeah, of, of this guy. Yeah, corresponding to x tilde. No, well, okay, we'll see when I do the root group calculations where it's coming from, but I'm saying you have the, the, these four entries and uh, these four entries. You have an M and an M inverse. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we'll discuss that later. Why do you say that you're only one copy? Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Hmm. All right. We will come back to this when we calculate the root groups. We'll come back to this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, why don't, can we come back to this? Yeah. Let's come back to this. Okay. So um, anyway, <clears throat> so this disconnectedness that comes up here is a pervasive problem of the uh, of the non simply connected case. Huh? <clears throat> Okie dokie. Um, 
All right. So, uh, so anyway, so one thing I would just like to stress before we go on, which is, uh, so it's a general, it's a good general principle uh, when one is first trying to wrap one's head around um, what, you know, around this general theory uh, to focus on the case of simply connected groups. Um, the simply connected case has a variety of simplifications that um, kind of break down in various bad ways when we try to go beyond it. And one of the more basic ones is this phenomenon we see for PGL2 where we get these disconnected special fiber, okay? And so this is a sort of pervasive problem. Um, so disconnectedness of the various integral models that show up of the special fibers of the various integral models that show up so-called parahoric, well, not parahoric groups, but other groups like the, if you try to look at the integral models of the maximal compacts, for example, um, beyond the simply connected case, you tend to get a lot of disconnectedness. So disconnectedness of this um, for, um, for G, for example, corresponding to maximal bounded subgroups inside G of K, this is a pervasive feature when you're dealing with groups that are not simply connected, <clears throat> okay? So um, as I say, PGL2 kind of illustrates this, um, but what you wind up often studying is you get uh, various uh, bounded open subgroups. So when we eventually define the building, which hopefully we'll do by the end of today, at least in the split case, we'll do the general case next time. Um, but when you look at the stabilizers of various points, then what you wind up getting is a kind of chain of various kinds of uh, subgroups that, uh, <clears throat> that fix the point. Uh, this and then and there's an even bigger one. So there are various uh, groups of uh, bounded open subgroups that fix a point that are in, of interest in various ways. Uh, there are these guys that are called parahorics, and then there are these slightly bigger ones um, but in the simply connected case, these all collapse to the same thing. In any event, the, the bottom line is simply that when you deal with, with uh, non-simply connected groups, then in the study of various interesting uh, bounded open subgroups, you wind up having to grapple with disconnectedness problems on the special fiber that you don't encounter in the, non, in the simply connected case. Okay, so that's just one thing to bear in mind that this disconnectedness that we see for PGL2 is in fact a fairly ubiquitous feature. Um, on the other hand, then you might think, okay, so we should just ignore uh, groups that are not simply connected and only think about the simply connected case. And that's all fine and well, um, but then you lose some things. So on the other hand, so the adjoint quotient acts on the group. And so correspondingly, the rational points uh, also act on the group. Um, so you wind up getting an action once we define what the building is and it'll have nice functorial properties. Uh, you wind up getting an action of this on here and that turns out to be nothing more than the fact that it will turn out that the building of G and the building of its adjoint quotient are naturally the same. And so you have this action on here which transfers into the action here coming from this. The point I just wanna make is that you see G of K maps to the adjoint quotient. This also acts on the building. These are compatible, but typically K is very far from algebraically closed. This is very far from surjective, okay? So if you throw away the fact that you have uh, the theory for this guy here, then this action is not quite as accessible as it is if you knew that it was really the same as the building of the group G at itself, for example. Anyway, there are a variety of other reasons. It's quite beautiful that we have the theory um, for general G, but I'm just saying if you throw out the uh, non-simply connected case, then the presence of this action is not quite as directly accessible as it is if you, one has that this is really the same as the building of the adjoint group. Okay, uh, I wanna make one other remark uh, about disconnectedness. So, uh, which is the following. So you might think 
that if you're confronted with some smooth model, which has disconnected special fiber, then maybe you can simply uh, get around that by just removing the non-identity part. So given the smooth affine model, script G of G, then you can always form, so G zero, you can simply take G and remove from it the non-identity components of the special fiber. Namely, the special fiber is closed, the non-identity parts is closed, so you take this closed thing out of this, and then inside of here, you get something open, inside of G, and you say, oh, great, now I have something that's smooth and aft smooth with connected uh, special fiber just by design. Now, you have to do a little bit more work to show that this is also affine, but it is. And so you might think, well, that's great, so why don't I just, if my special fiber of this group scheme, however these things are gonna be made, and we'll really get to that next time, um, then if it happens to have disconnected special fiber, why don't I just remove it? Well, the problem is that the O points of this are typically a proper subgroup of this, since already on the special fiber, You know, typically, if you make your residue feel big enough, you will start to have some rational points outside of the identity component. And because, you see, it's very critical, because our schemes are smooth and our base ring is either complete or Henselian, rational points on the special fiber always lift to integral points. This is a basic fact about smooth schemes over a complete DVR. And so the moment you have such an extra point, you lift it and then it would be outside. So the point is that if you strip away the non-identity components, your group of O points will shrink. And so you won't be getting the same uh, open subgroup of the rational points that you thought you were getting. So that's just to keep in mind that disconnectedness may be an essential feature of, some, disconnectedness of the special fiber may be an essential feature of some of these integral models. And it's not something you can just artificially remove without screwing up the group of O points that you were trying to work with in the first place. Okay. So um, that being said, so I'd like to come back to this, uh, this example uh, with, uh, <clears throat> with SP4. And to understand this uh, group K tilde that I'm now erasing. <clears throat> okay, so let's return to SP4. Okay, so... Um, so this is gonna be our group G, four by four symplectic matrices. And inside of here, we have a maximal torus and it's given by T1 inverse, T2 inverse, T1, T2. We're here at T1 and T2 are just uh, our, our invertible elements, okay? So this is a maximal torus. And we're gonna uh, work out the root groups in a moment. And what we wanna do is um, we want to kind of revisit, we want to interpret the strange K inside of SP4 uh, using, uh, using the roots for S. Okay, so let's do this as follows. <clears throat> so uh, first I would like to write out or recall what are the root groups for SP4. So, <clears throat> so let's first draw the, uh, draw the root system again. Oh, that was a pretty bad square, hold on. Slightly better. Okay, so here's A, B, A plus B, 2A plus B, and so on. Um, so inside the four by four matrices, so for each root relative to this torus, uh, we have the corresponding root group. So this is gonna be a copy of GA, in which, which is stabilized by the torus and on whose Lie algebra the torus acts through a specific character. 
Now, the thing I want to stress, which is going to be critical to, every, and we're going to write these down in a moment. Um, the thing I want to stress is the way that you identify each root group with GA. This is a very critical choice to make. And we're going to see that one of the key insights in Brewer Tits theory is to come up with a way to talk about points in a root group being near or far from the origin in a way that is not super dependent, or at least is more robust with respect to how you identify it with GA, okay? So I'm gonna write down a very specific identification of each root group with GA, and then we're gonna see what happens when we start changing them. So here, so here they are. Um, so UA of X, so one zero minus X one, one X zero one, uh, U minus A of X, so one, X, zero, one, uh, one, zero, it's one. And then we have UB. So here, A and B, these two guys, so these are these, so if we think about the torus in terms of these coordinates, uh, A of T1, T2 is T1 to the minus two, and B, uh, sorry, sorry, T1 over T2, and B of T1, T2 is uh, T1 to the minus two. Uh, <clears throat> so here's UB. So uh, identity matrix, X zero, zero, zero. Identity matrix, more zeros down there. Uh, U minus B. <clears throat> We're just gonna uh, flip those around. Uh, put the X down here. Again with the identity. <clears throat> and uh, Next, we're going to do uh, UA plus B. Uh, this is going to have the identity XX, zero, zero. Identity, then we have the opposite root group, U minus A plus B. Uh, we're going to put these down here. Identity, two by two identity, two by two identity, zero. And then lastly, we have Two A plus B, and this is zero 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 X identity identity. And we, lastly, we have the opposite root group two A plus B. Okay, it's just good to go down here. Okay, so what's the point of doing all this? So we'd like to see how these matrix entries, so these are isomorphisms for each root C, I specified an isomorphism of GA with the root group U sub C, the root group for C. And these are these explicit isomorphisms that we've done here. Now, <clears throat> these are particularly preferred because SP4 has an integral structure, namely SP4 over O, and these isomorphisms respect that integral structure. So we'll be coming back to that uh, <clears throat> in a little bit. So now let's see where K tilde intersects these guys. So let's write it down. So, so let me first remind you what K tilde was again. Uh, let's come back to that. So here are the entries, O, O, M, O, 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 inverse. O, M, O, O, and M, 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 O. Okay, intersect SP4. Okay, so, uh, so now let's see, where does this meet each of these root groups? <clears throat> oh, goodness. Okay, so these are like on opposite sides of the board here. So for example, if we look at U sub A, here are these two entries here and here, right? And then if we go over here, we see these are O. Okay, so if we look at where this meets each of these root groups, uh, so what we get is, so UA, we get everything. But if we go to the opposite root group, for example, right, so here, here is the X here and there. And so here you see those are in the maximal ideal. Okay, so for the opposite root, 
uh, these live in the maximal ideal. Uh, likewise for B, we get uh, UB of O, U minus B, uh, the common entry corresponds to O. Uh, if you look at UA plus B, you want getting O for A plus B and the maximal ideal for the opposite. And then finally, uh, for the last one, we get M and M inverse. Let me just write those down. So for 2A plus B, you get M for 2A plus B, and for its opposite, that will correspond to this entry here, you get M inverse. Okay, so, um, and by the way, uh, this and this, those are the two SL2s that I was referring to before. Um, <clears throat> anyway, okay, so why have I uh, written these down? Uh, sorry, sorry, this should be O. No, what, what? Uh, M, M inverse. Is it okay? Let's see, 2A two, two plus B. Right here. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, there and there. Right, so. Oh, oh, do I have the M and M inverse in the wrong spot? Oh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, thank you, thank you, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so here's the interesting thing. So the reason for writing this all out is, so now, so what's going on in this example is this group is, and it turns out it's actually generated by these things. So along the diagonal, we have the O points of the maximal torus, and then we have these pieces on the root groups and these generate the whole thing. I mean, one can show that. And the thing I wanna point out is, so you ask yourself, this conditions that inside, right? Inside of these rational points, right? If you look on K points, so K is going to UC of K, right? So by using this isomorphism, we kind of identify this with K and then we can consider the group of elements whose absolute value is below some bound. Okay, being very, you know, how close to the origin are you? And in these cases, we're exactly the valuation ring. Here, your absolute value is less than one. Here, the absolute value is only slightly bigger than one and so on. But I wanna give you another way to recover these by a purely geometric process involving the affine diagram, uh, involving the picture of the affine root system. So, so here's what we're gonna do. So let's come back to this picture. Picture of the affine root system. And we drew in these various lines corresponding to setting a root equal to the lines defined by root equals some integer, right? And then there are parallel copies that keep going up, down, left, and right, okay? And we're looking at, um, at this particular point here, okay? So through this point, X tilde, so again, this is uh, A, B, 2A plus B. So this point is half of 2A plus B, right? It's halfway along that vector there. Um, and so what I wanna do is through this point, X tilde, I want to draw the parallel copies of all of the root lines. So for each family of parallel uh, hyperplanes, which are lines here. There are kind of eight different directions, right, for each of the eight different roots. Well, really, there are only four different directions because you have the root and it's negative. Um, but I want to sort of look at the parallel copies that go through this point. And I want to make the equations for these. So this is my point X tilde. And so, for example, here is A. And so the question is, here is the so-called root hyperplane for A. It's the thing defined by perpendicularity to A. And if I translate it to pass through this point, what is the equation? So depending on whether you use A or minus A. So what is the linear form that vanishes on that, you know, we go through there where the, uh, it's just a parallel translate of that. So it's gonna begin with plus or minus, so 
a dot vector plus some constant. And in this case, the constant winds up being minus a half. Okay? Right, so in other words, if you take the dot product of a with x, you get a half. So if you subtract a half, this is a linear form which whose defining hyperplane, whose line passes through this point, okay, and its kind of derivative is, is, is gradient, if you will, is A itself. Or you can do the same thing with the opposite root. Okay, so we do that for that line. And then we can do the same thing for the other lines. So if we go with, uh, for example, B, right? So this is the direction that's perpendicular to B. These are the families, the parallel, parallel lines. But we're just going to take, oh, actually, it's this one already does the job. Okay, so then we don't need any constant term. Um, so here we have for B, it's just plus or minus B dot B. Okay, and now we're gonna do the same thing for the, uh, for the other two roots, and then you'll see where this is going. So for example, if we take uh, A plus B, which is this, here's the perpendicular plane, but if we wanna make it pass through this, we have to move it up, okay? And so then we have to take the defining equation of that. So this is, uh, for a plus b, uh, and this winds up being um, so plus or minus a plus b dot v uh, minus a half. And then finally, for this guy here, so we have the line. So for 2a plus b, we take the hyperplane and then we shift it to pass through this point. So we have to adjust the defining equation with a constant. Uh, and in this case, the constant winds up being minus one. Okay, so what? So we have a bunch of these affine linear forms of the form C dot V plus R, or if you like, R sub C, okay? So, so for each root, we draw the equation, of, we take the root hyperplane, parallel translate to pass through the point, and then we look at these constant terms. Some of them are not integers, that's okay. But now what I claim is, if we look at the condition, inside of here, you look at the condition that the ord of a number is greater than or equal to the value of that thing at zero, in other words, the constant term. So for example, let's take A. For A, we see minus one, minus one half. And if we impose the condition, we look at stuff in the field whose ord is at least minus a half. Well, it's a normalized valuation. So if your valuation is at least minus a half, then in fact, you must be greater than or equal to zero and you get this. On the other hand, if you take minus A, then you get plus a half as the constant term. And then you would have the ord is greater than or equal to a half. But since you're integer valued valuation, grade equal to a half means you're grade equal to one, which is exactly putting you in the maximal ideal. So the point is this actually goes over to exactly these, uh, these things. So this K tilde uh, intersect U C of K. So this is a very curious thing that if you take the root hyperplanes translated to pass through the vertex of interest, and then you use this parameter is this particular parameterization that I've given you, then the condition on K that the ORD, the normalized valuation is at least the constant term, turns out to exactly capture precisely the root groups that show up in this thing, okay? This is not a coincidence, okay? And this is gonna turn out to reflect the mechanism that's gonna connect up the description of points in an apartment to the corresponding open subgroups of stabilizers, okay? But the key thing I just wanna stress here is that there is some, admittedly at this point, quite mysterious looking, a systematic process where you take a point and you translate all the root hyperplanes to pass through that point. And then you look at the corresponding constant terms and that's giving you the valuation conditions which exactly cut out where that maximal, where that stabilizer group meets each of these different root groups. Now you could ask, why am I evaluating, by taking the constant term, I'm evaluating at the origin. Why am I evaluating at the origin? And that's related to the fact that we're working with a reductive integral model of SP4. Okay, so <clears throat> that's something that I'll kind of get to next time. Um, but anyway, the, the, the point I just wanna stress is that 
the presence of this um, strange group is in fact tightly related to this particular point in the sense that is somehow revealed by this admittedly strange looking process where I took all the root hyperplanes, I translated them to pass through this point, and then I evaluated that resulting affine functional at zero. And then if I use those to define valuation conditions, I wind up getting exactly these subgroups of the root groups. And these turn out to be precisely the things that together with the maximal, the O points of the torus actually give us this group. So this is some procedure that goes from points in this, uh, this picture with the hyperplanes to bounded open subgroups, okay? And this is a special case of what will be a very systematic process in bruja titz theory. But the thing I just wanna emphasize is that what we're using here are these affine linear functionals, okay? Where we take the root hyperplanes, but we translate them to pass through a specified point, okay? So this is kind of the key thing. Okay, so let's, so anyway, that's the case of K tilde. And it's just meant to suggest that there is some way of going from a point in this plane to, um, <clears throat> to a bounded open subgroup by some systematic process. Right, right. So this is what I'm gonna turn to next. So like, what is it about this particular coordinatization that's, that's making this tick? The reason that these are being evaluated, we'll come back to this next time, but the reason that we're evaluating these at zero is connected to the fact that these are all being computed relative to this SP4 over O model for the group. So, so what's going on here is, so the evaluation at zero is very tightly related to these isomorphisms really reflecting the O group, uh, SP4, as a model of SP4 over K. So admittedly, admittedly, I am, uh, you know, we're computing this group K tilde, which is not SP4 of O, but the actual calculations that I'm making are somehow using these particular parameterizations, but there's an O group SP4, and that has root groups over O. And so this is the thing I would like to turn to next, which is, so the theory of root groups, um, the theory of root groups kind of has, has um, let me just say, makes sense. For O models. So when one learns about reductive groups over fields, you do a lot of things that ultimately reduce the calculations with SL2. And in many places, you seem to be using the theory over fields in a crucial way. And in particular, when one develops a theory of root groups, again, everything feels like it's very specific to working over fields. But in fact, there's a very broad perspective that uh, Gopal and I, we call this dynamic method, where the theory of root groups for torus actions can actually be carried out with fairly general smooth affine groups over any ring, not just over a field. In the context of what are called reductive groups over O, which I'll now be turning to, this looks very similar to the theory over a field. But in fact, this is something that can be done for fairly general kinds of smooth affine groups. Now in brouat titts theory, there are gonna be these smooth affine models whose special fibers will not be reductive. But nonetheless, there will be a good theory of root groups for these things working over O, which on the generic fiber recovers the standard theory for reductive groups, and on the special fiber recovers some blob because the special fiber is some non-reductive group and you know, it's a little bit of a mystery, okay? But then you can pass to the reductive quotient and it becomes then again a more familiar thing, right? But the thing I just wanna emphasize, which I'm now gonna spell out in the reductive case is simple, oh, what, uh, what time is it? This thing was not turned on, so I have no idea how much time I have left. 10 minutes, 15 minutes? 12, 12 minutes, okay. So, so for reductive O group G, and by reductive O group, what I mean is uh, the special fiber is also connected reductive. 
as well as the generic fiber, okay? So if I give you a reductive O group, and let's suppose inside of it, I have a split fiber-wise maximal torus. And this just means it's a bunch of copies of GM viewed as some O group. Okay, suppose I'm in a situation like this. I am in a situation like this over here. We have SP4, and then we have this two-dimensional uh, maximal torus with the T1 and the T2 as the coordinates. Okay, so, so in this picture, you, it winds up that you again have over O some kind of open cell, something very analogous to the theory of the open cell over fields, where this is under multiplication coming in, where U plus is some product in any order at all over, the, over a choice of positive system of roots, and U minus is a product in any order at all of a system of negative roots. And there, is a, and there are these root groups. These all happen to be GA over O. In the broader setting of brouet titz theories we'll be discussing next time, these things may be somewhat more complicated. But for now, so each of these, each of these guys is a copy of GA uh, over O. So here's what we can do with this. Uh, it turns out that again, as in the theory over fields, if you take commutators, you wind up landing inside the product of the root groups over all the roots, and I'll call it phi AB. So all the roots that are to the form PA plus QB, where P and Q are positive integers. So if you take the commutator of any two of these, just like in the theory over a field, any such commutator can be written in relative to a fixed ordering of these roots uh, of those root groups. And the point is that if you actually compute those commutators, then what you get when you write it out as a product is going to be some, uh, some of these, these, <clears throat> these exponents. So with an x to the p, uh, whoops, sorry, let's get this in the right order here. Uh, just give me a second. So you're going to have some constants in front. These are some integers, usually plus minus 1, plus minus 2, plus minus 3. Uh, and then you have a uh, x to the p, y to the q. Okay, so you're gonna have, there's some universal formula given by some Chevalet commutation relations that <clears throat> relate this to this. This works over the ring. And then you have some, con some constants here. As I say, these are gonna be some integers that you can arrange to be plus minus one, plus minus two, or plus minus three. So what's the point of this? Let's suppose that you're in here. And then I tell you that the valuation of this is at least something and the valuation of this is at least something. So let's consider this calculation where the order of x is at least some r and the order of y is at least some s. Then what you would have here, what's the order of this? Well, this is an integer, so its order is non-negative. And then the order of this would be at least p times the order of that, which is r, and then q times the order of this, which is s. So the order of cpq, x to the p, y to the q, is at least PR plus QS. Okay, so what? Okay, so now comes the great idea of valuations on root groups. So we have a valuation on our field, but these root groups are one dimensional vector spaces over the field. They don't have a preferred basis. Nonetheless, we have a notion of norm on a vector space. And so we could contemplate some kind of idea of, could we talk about a notion of absolute value for an element, a rational point of the root group without having to rely on the vector space structure? So let's try to consider the idea of evaluation on a vector space, in our case, a one-dimensional vector space, one of these root groups. 
So if you think about what should a notion of absolute value be, let's imagine writing it like this. Suppose you want to talk about the notion of a norm vector space. It's admittedly just one dimensional. Um, and you write your absolute value as absolute pi to some phi v. So here, phi is going to be some function. And we'll call it phi sub c into r union infinity, where zero is the only thing that goes to infinity. And let's consider what are the conditions on an absolute value. Well, one condition we have is absolute v plus w should be less than or equal to the max of absolute v and absolute w. And this, of course, turns into the condition that phi at v plus w should be greater than or equal to the min of phi of v, phi of w. But if you think about it, the condition that this always holds is exactly the condition that if you look at the stuff whose valuation is at least some r, maybe I'll call this uh, uh, uc case of r, that this is simply a subgroup. You're just saying that whenever each of these is at least something, so is the sum. So these guys are subgroups. Okay, so that's one condition uh, on the absolute value. On the other hand, we have the vector space property. So let's look a little bit at that. So we have the condition absolute alpha v should be the uh, absolute value of v times the absolute value of alpha, or in terms of ords, phi of alpha v should be equal to phi of v uh, plus the ord of alpha. Okay, now the thing is, I don't want to actually rely too much on the vector space structure because when we go to groups like SU3, the corresponding root group will be non-commutative, okay? It will not be a, a vector space per se. However, there's a shadow of the vector space structure, which is the action of the torus. Let us look at the special case. We're working in this particular group here. Let's think about what happens when we act on the inside by some element of the torus. Well, that is expressed using the vector space structure. That's exactly what we get when we hit this with the scalar. Oh, but then we can use this. And so then we get phi of u. So I should begin to be putting a uh, c here. Sorry, my, my, my root is c. c, and then we have plus the ord of c of s. Okay, so these two conditions that I have my function on each of the root groups with the property that the stuff with, that, with hitting greater than or equal to r is a subgroup and satisfying this condition. These are properties that make intrinsic sense and that don't involve saying the root group is a vector space. And these could be meaningful even when the root group is non-commutative, which does in fact happen for things like SU3 and beyond. Okay, anyway, the bottom line is there are some further properties that one may want to impose so let me just say these conditions, so the requirement that this is equal to this, the requirement that these are subgroups using these functions, plus I'll just say a few more axioms, such as some relationship between the one for C and the one for minus C, I won't get into exactly what that is. This leads to the notion of evaluation on a root datum. This is some collection of functions on each of the root groups that satisfy various conditions. And starting from one of these, we will then get a collection of groups for each root C. We take the pre-image of the stuff greater than or equal to R under that, these will be, and this is one of these axioms, these will be bounded open subgroups. Okay? 
And so then we get a point. We get, I'm sorry, we get a subgroup, which I'll just call uh, GK uh, phi R, which is the subgroup generated by the O points of my torus and these, th this collection of subgroups, one for each root. Okay, so starting from evaluation on a root datum, I can form a collection of, uh, of these points. Now, this is just some crazy subgroup, okay? The key point is there's a special class of valuations called Chevalet valuations, which in the split case are exactly the things that I was writing down coming from these integral root group models. And if you take these things to be Chevalet valuations or certain variants of them, which I'll discuss at the beginning of next time, I, I think I'm out of time, more or less. One minute, yeah, okay. So, so let me just say, I'll just end by making a definition or an observation. Oh, sorry. I should have, so there was one other crucial thing I should have pointed out, which is if you take the commutator for two roots, phi A R and B phi S, where here uh, B and A are not multiples of each other, this will always be contained in the group generated by U P A plus Q B C P R plus Q S over all roots of the form P A plus Q B. Okay, this is basically that ord calculation that I did earlier with the powers of X and Y. All right, so this is a condition on these things. And that's what makes it turns out to make this a very interesting group. And so now I'll just end by saying, so next time we'll see that if we consider, well, valuations on the root datum give rise to the actual notion of an apartment, okay? So an apartment associated to a Maximal, the maximal split torus is not a real vector space. It is a certain affine space for that real vector space, okay? That if we think about the, the co-character lattice tends to with the reals, which is the picture I was drawing for SP4, that is a vector space. But certain collections of valuations will form an affine space. And those will be the actual apartments. And those are the things that we're going to wind up gluing in some very subtle way to make the building. And then the group will act on that and we'll get these stabilizer groups. But these valuations are going to be what cut out the various root groups that we're going to assemble to generate the bounded open subgroups, as in the case that we saw for K tilde with SP4. Okay, so next time we'll say more about these valuations how that gives rise to the building and how that connects back to the integral models and how we can understand their special fibers. So I'll do that next time. Are there questions or remarks? Where does the field enter? Is it, it seems, Sorry? it seems to be independent of the field, right? In some sense. No, no, so the notion of valuation of the root datum has this crucial condition, right? That when you see how the torus acts on the root group, that it changes it by a certain constant, which involves the ord of the root applied to that torus element. So it has to be a valued field. Yeah, that's quite critical for this. But you could have put real numbers also in what a Yes, yes, and, and I, yes, so we're, the reason that we're going to um, allow, I mean, you could say these are just integers, right? But we're gonna allow ourselves to change things by, by real numbers. You can take any of these valuations and just add a real number to it, you get another one. Now, of course, you might ask, why would you wanna do that, okay? And the reason is not so unlike in the theory of root systems, right? The theory of root systems is a purely algebraic theory and it makes sense even over the rational numbers. Why introduce the real numbers, right? The reason that we think about root systems on real vector spaces is because then when we remove hyperplanes, we can talk about connected components. 
And it would be a nightmare to try to describe that purely algebraically in the language of linear inequalities. So we use the topology of the reals. Here, the reason for thinking about these apartments as real vector spaces is it's gonna turn out to give this building the structure of a complete metric space with a metric that's gonna have a negative curvature property. And that's gonna be an absolutely critical feature for exploiting the geometry of the building. So roughly in the same way as a the theory of root systems harnesses connectedness to get some mileage out of working over the reals, here, the reason that we're gonna allow this real scaling is the apartment will be a real vector space and that will give the resulting space that we get a completeness property and then even a negative curvature property that will wind up giving us very useful geometry. Other questions? Um, if not, we thank the speaker again. Okay.